today we have with us Dr. Nicole Gillespie from the Knowles Teaching Initiative, formerly the Knowles Science Teaching Foundation. And she'll explain the changes in the title too, I think. Okay. Uh, and if that sounds familiar, Dr. Gillespie will also explain why that name sounds slightly familiar. Uh, Nicole has a very interesting educational background. She has her bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis. And her uh, graduate work, her master's and PhD in uh, math education, I believe, from Berkeley, U.S. Uh, University of California at Berkeley. So uh, she comes to us well prepared. And fortunately, Harry Knowles, our resident, uh, was able to grab her to work at the Knowles Foundation many years ago, and she's progressed through several positions there to be executive director now. And she's been in that position for 13 years, I believe? Uh, executive director for four. Executive director at the foundation for 15. Right. So without further ado, may I introduce Dr. Gillespie. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me and for um, showing up on this lovely Saturday morning. I'm sure there's some other things you could be doing on a great day like this. But I am delighted and honored to be here. Um, as Dorothy said, I'm Nicole Gillespie. I'm the executive director of the Knowles Teacher Initiative. Um, we have been in existence since 1999. Um, we were founded as the Janet H. and C. Harry Knowles Foundation. And if that sounds familiar, in fact, it is Medford Lee's very own Harry Knowles who had the brilliant idea for this and has so generously supported us through the years. So um, as Dorothy mentioned, we've just recently changed our name. We were the Knowles Science Teaching Foundation, and I'm going to come back to that at the end. And I think it'll be a little bit clearer why we've made this change when I get through this. So I'm going to talk to you about who we are in the world. And our core, our core um, value is that we believe that teachers can and should be the primary agents of educational improvement. So I'm going to tell you how we do that, how we support teachers to be those agents of improvement. But before I get into that, I'm going to start with a story to help explain to you what we do and why. So this story takes place in the 1970s in an area between Colombia and Venezuela and South America. So um, this is Los Llanos. It's a savanna region between Colombia and Venezuela. You can see it's fairly arid, not much grows there. Back in the 1970s, a group of engineers, technicians, uh, artisans, took on the challenge of building a sustainable community in this area. And the name of that community was Gaviotas. So as you could imagine, in order for people to live there, they had to get pretty innovative. So they did a lot of things like developing some technology um, water pumps that were operated by children playing on seesaws. Uh, they developed lots of solar connectors or collectors lots of um, windmills to take advantage of the winds in the area. They also were looking for plants, different kinds of plant species that would survive in this environment. <coughs> and what they found was there was a particular kind of pine tree called the Caribbean pine that with the right kind of nurturing and nutrients and care grew very quickly in this thin soil where normally not much else grew. So this was kind of a surprise everybody. Um, they planted lots and lots of these trees, they had a nursery, um, and something surprising happened. They found that with the right kind of care and the right kind of input, these trees were growing 20% faster than expected. And it was a little bit of a mystery, but they were pretty excited. And they were doing lots of things like the, the trees, they, they still make a turpentine out of it. They were making lots of stuff from these trees themselves. But then something really interesting happened and that they found that in the undergrowth of those pine trees, 250 different species that had not been seen for centuries began to flourish. And this was a little bit of a mystery. Um, they didn't know if these had been seeds that were dormant in the soil for a long time, or if birds were bringing seeds from other places into what was now a sustainable habitat for them. Um, but whatever the reason was, it was pretty amazing. So Gaviotis now has 20,000 acres of these pine trees. It is a fully canopied rainforest. And in fact, it has changed the ecosystem in this area. There's 10% more rainfall in this area now with this rainforest than there was before they built it. So 
By this point, you're probably wondering why I'm standing up here talking to you about an ecosystem in South America instead of science and math education. But there's a reason. And the reason for that is that the Los Llanos, Gaviotis, this area I just told you about, like all ecosystems, is a complex system. And complex systems are marked by certain things. So complex systems cannot be controlled in, from the top down. Um, changes come from within. They're hard to predict. And there are no easy answers. There's no easy solutions for complex systems. Education in the United States is also a complex system. I would argue probably the whole world, but I'm more of an expert in the United States. So these pine trees are a, an analogy for us. They were the catalyst that changed this ecosystem that I just told you about in Gaviotis. We believe that the way to change the complex system of education in the United States is to introduce similar catalysts. And for us, those catalysts are teachers. Specifically, for us, it is beginning high school math and science teachers. So these teachers that I'm going to tell you about, I'm going to tell you about how we select them, how we support them, and how we develop them to be the catalysts that are going to change the system from the inside. And I'm going to start with telling you how we select these teachers. It is, a, it is an arduous process. Um, we, to give you a little bit of a uh, preview of where we're going, we award about 35 fellowships each year to beginning high school math and science teachers. So how do we decide on narrowing that down to just 35? Um, that you'll see that number in a minute. It is a pretty involved process. Um, but we don't just stop there. We provide them with five full years of very intensive support that we have been working on developing and designing since 2002 when we offered the first teaching fellowships. One of the most important things about this program is that we support teachers to make connections with each other. And I'm gonna tell you right now that is probably the most important thing we do, and I'm gonna try and make that clear to you why that is so important in this talk. And then finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the impact that we're having. Um, we are constantly reflecting on, revising, um, updating what we do. So it is always a work in progress. Um, it, is a, it is a tough thing to measure. Harry can tell you that he and I argue about this roughly all the time. Um, but I think our, our impact, um, we're starting to see some pretty impressive results. Okay, so let me start with selection. Um, ultimately, what we're about is we believe that the United States needs more and better math and science teachers. So this is what we're all about. <coughs> We award, like I said, about 35 of these fellowships each year. So we get, I'm going to say, 150 to 200 applicants. That is already a pretty select group. Um, anybody who's going to go through our process, which is rigorous and time consuming, is already the cream of the crop. Um, we narrow that down even further to 35 people, which is not an easy job. Um, we are specifically looking to support brand new high school math and science teachers with this fellowship. And this is not an accident. So we, we get a lot of experienced teachers that come to us and say, hey, I want this too, um, which I can't blame them. But the idea is if we focus on teachers at the beginning of their career, the trajectory and the potential for what they can accomplish is tremendous. So because we have, like everybody else, the resources are limited, we have chosen to focus on early career teachers because we think that's where we're going to get the most payoff. The folks we're looking for, we're looking for people who have excellent disciplinary knowledge. Um, and this means particular things when you're a teacher. So has anybody in here ever been, are there any ex-teachers in here? <laughs> excellent, <laughs> excellent. Um, so you all know, and, and the rest of you might be able to guess that, um, the way one needs to know things in order to be a good teacher is very different than the way you need to know it to do anything else. So for example, I was an engineer for a while. Um, I thought I was pretty good at math and science. I thought I was all set to teach high school science, and I was very, very wrong. <laughs> um, so we're looking for folks who have a good disciplinary background, for sure, but that is just the beginning, and I'll tell you a little bit more about where we go from that. Um, in addition to having great disciplinary knowledge in math and or science, 
We are looking for folks who have the capacity and the drive and the commitment to be career teachers. Now, these are young folks. Um, they're usually within a year or two of graduating from college. Um, it's fairly easy to say, I've always wanted to be a teacher, particularly if there's something like a big fellowship at stake. Um, we've gotten very good at peeling back those layers and really trying to figure out, do folks understand, first of all, teaching is hard. It is an intellectually complex, challenging work. So the folks that are thinking, hey, I get my summers off and spring break, they don't get very far. Um, we want folks who, even at the beginning, understand that this is hard work and it is worthy of the best and the brightest that we have. And then last, and certainly not least, possibly most important, what we're looking for is people who have leadership capacity. And that means something very specific to us. We are not looking for the folks who are going to be like the teachers you see in the movie. You know, the lone hero who all by themselves saved that school from all those other rotten teachers and saved those, those kids. This is not how it works in the real world, in real schools. Um, teaching is a collective effort. So for us, leadership means teachers who have the potential to connect with their peers, to lift their peers, to mobilize their peers, to make a difference for all students. So this is how we think about leadership. So this process that I told you about that's pretty rigorous, um, it is, I think when I've, I've been to two rounds of grad school, this is much harder than what I had to go through to get into grad school. Um, they do a written application that's due a little after Thanksgiving. Like I said, we usually get somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 to 200 applications. We weed through those. We do phone interviews with about half, maybe a little more than half, as semi-finalists. They're hour-long interviews that we've scripted out and we've, think, we've thought through very carefully how to analyze those responses. From there, we invite usually about 70 finalists to come to Philadelphia, so we pay for them to all fly to Philadelphia for a weekend, where they go through a pretty intense weekend with team interviews, individual interviews, um, we have conversations at meals, we set up team building activities, so it is an intense time. I mean, it's hard work for us, but I'm glad I'm not on the other side of it. Um, and then finally, the staff takes all this data that we've gathered, does some analysis, makes some recommendations, and our board of trustees, two of whom are sitting in the front row here, make the final decision on our recommendations for awarding these fellowships. So like I said, usually it's about 35. It's not a hard number. This past year, we had a large group. We awarded 37. That was our biggest cohort ever. So it fluctuates. Um, the people entering the teaching profession fluctuates quite a bit with the state of the economy. So we see those results, but it's about this much each year. Okay, so I keep telling you we award about 35 fellowships a year, and you might be thinking, if you think you're gonna change the education system in the United States, and you're only awarding 35 fellows a year, or fellowships a year, it seems like a mismatch. The point I wanna make is that what we are doing is building a national network. So although we invest heavily in individuals who demonstrate tremendous potential, what we are doing is slowly building this network. Yes, each year we think we are supporting 35 great individual teachers, but more importantly, what we are doing is supporting 35 people who are adding to this network and growing it because we're helping them develop these connections in their own schools and districts. So the program that I've been talking about, um, it's a five-year fellowship program, and that five years is not an arbitrary number. Um, depending on whose research you look at, you'll see somewhere between 30 to 50 percent of all new teachers leave the profession within the first five years. That is an enormous attrition rate. We spend a lot of money trying to train new teachers, trying to hire new teachers. So this is, this is not good for our country to have so many teachers leaving the profession. So early on, the decision was made that those five years are critical. Let's figure out what it takes to keep the best, most talented teachers in the profession. If we can figure that out, then we have something to share with the field. Whoops. So we, this five-year program, we divide it into three phases, and the bulk of it is a program that we have been designing and tweaking and refining since 2002. Um, I'm gonna talk about that program, but I also wanna tell you there's some, some added goodies that go with it. 
Um, each fellow has access to a pot of money each year. It's about eight to ten thousand dollars that they can use for classroom materials. They can use to go get additional training in particular areas that we don't have expertise in. Um, and they can also use it for leadership activities in their school. So they do that through a grant process. Um, they also have, I want to emphasize at this point, that our staff who works with these fellows, every one of us is a former teacher. About three quarters of us have doctorate degrees, doctorate degrees in education. Um, and everybody's got some other kind of experience working with new teachers. So a big part of this, of the benefits that these folks get is our staff, the experience and the expertise of our staff who act as mentors and coaches. So the very first phase, this is the first two years of the program. Um, the, most of the fellows at this point are first or second year teachers. And what we focus on in this beginning page is developing their content knowledge for teaching. So you heard me say that we pick folks who are, have really impressive disciplinary backgrounds. And we say, that's great. That's a great start. It's not enough. So we spend the first two years helping them really dig into their own knowledge and thinking about, how did I come to understand this? Where are my gaps? How am I going to interact with a student who wasn't like me, a student who's not good at math or doesn't love science? Um, how do we really get into that content and help students engage in this? And of course, this is always about creating profound learning opportunities for students. If this isn't ultimately about students learning math and science, then we're missing the point. So this is what the first two years is about. The second phase, the second two years, I apologize. Um, we do a lot more work with our fellows to help them start learning to study their own teaching. So one of our goals is to help them recognize that they are, they should be the folks generating knowledge about teaching and learning. Um, Education is a little bit weird in this, in this realm. In medicine, physicians are expected to be generating new knowledge and sharing that with the field. In education, people don't really expect teachers to do that. They expect researchers and other folks to do that and hand it down to teachers. So we're trying to upend that model. We're trying to unleash on this country a bunch of teachers who are capable of learning from their own practice, sharing what they've learned with other teachers, and improving the whole profession that way. Um, this is also the phase in the middle where we really support them to start getting out of their shells and making connections in their schools and districts. So this is not an easy thing for brand new teachers to do. Um, you know, a lot of teachers go into a big school and they feel a little daunted, there's more experienced teachers, but because we pour so much into them, we invest so much into them, the idea is that through them, we're going to impact the teachers around them. So in the middle of this program is we really start working with them to do that well. And then the third phase is only one year. It's the fifth year of the program. And this is when we are really focusing on helping them develop as leaders. And like I said earlier, for us, leadership does not mean the person who's in charge, who's telling everybody what to do. Leadership in the sense is who can connect their peers? Who can get their peers excited to be working together to drive change from the ground up? So this is an incredibly important part of what we do. And I'm going to show you a little bit more about that in the end. Um, Importantly, in this last phase, we're trying to help them understand what they're doing as teachers as being part of a complex system. So it's not enough to stand in front of your kids or your students and do a great job teaching. That is absolutely critical. But what we're pushing for is for them to be a bit bigger than that and help other teachers be able to do that as well. So the three phases of the fellowship, that's five years, but that's not the end. Um, once they complete the five years, they become senior fellows. And that, they are senior fellows for life. 80% um, of our fellows are still classroom teachers. Another, about 10% are involved in K-12 education in some way as principals, coaches, um, district supervisors, what have you. And then the other 10% who are not in education, most of them are home raising children. And they tend to step out for a bit and come back in. So we've done, dare I say, a great job of keeping great people in the profession, which was always part of what we wanted to do. Um, I'm going to tell you briefly about a new piece of our business that we're building called the Knowles Academy. And what we've realized is over the past 15 years of working really hard with these really great teachers is we've learned a lot about what teachers need. So now we're taking the next step is we're going to try and offer this to a broader audience. 
So the Knowles Academy will be a series of courses that teachers anywhere in the country can take. They'll be smaller bites than our five-year fellowship, but very much drawing on what we've learned. Um, we will also be um, offering services to schools and districts, again, based on what we've learned working with the teachers. So I want to talk a little bit, I'm sorry, microphone is shut a little bit more about this idea about connection and get back to complex systems and help you um, paint a picture of why this is so important. So in, here we go, come on. In complex systems, there's a thing that happens called emergent phenomena. So you can see it in schools of fish, on sand dunes, and here's a great example of an emergent phenomena. Um, these are starlings. And when you see starlings flying like this, it's called a murmuration starlings. So you see all these really beautiful patterns that the starlings are making. There's no starling in charge of this choreography in time they wear yellow. Um, nobody's given them directions. This comes about how the birds interact with each other. So they, they follow a simple set of rules about how close you get to the other birds and how fast you fly. I don't know them. I'm not a starling. Um, but because of those simple sets of rules of how they interact with each other, these complex patterns emerge. So you heard me say earlier that education in the U.S. is a complex system. Um, we have been trying since the beginning to do these top-down, let's test our students, let's have standards, let's fire the bad teachers. That's not working. That's not how you change complex systems. So complex systems change because the elements in the system start interacting differently. So what we're doing is looking at the teachers who, in an education system, with the exception of students, Teachers are the, are the largest subset of the education system. So what we're doing is saying, let's work with those elements of the system and let's change the way they interact with each other. If we can do that, we can change the system from the inside. Now, we can't exactly predict how it's gonna change, but we're seeding the system with teachers that we have given a lot of resources, we've given excellent training, um, they are very much in the core of their being, committed to teaching and reaching all students. So our goal is if we see the system with those teachers as catalysts, help them change the way they interact with other teachers, we have a pretty good chance of changing the system. Um, most teachers in the United States school system get very little professional development. So less than a third of math and science teachers get more than 35 hours a year. For a lot of reasons, um, one of them is money. By contrast, our teaching fellows get over 100 hours each year. So already, just on that measure, our fellows are miles ahead of most teachers. They just get a lot more training. And for those of you who have been teachers, you may remember if you finished your credential program, thinking you were all set, got into that classroom and realizing, oh, I'm not set, I have a lot to learn. Um, I think all teachers realize that, that just because they call it teacher preparation doesn't mean you're prepared. So 100 hours a year for five years is what our fellows get. So what's that getting to? Um, we did a study a few years ago where we went to principals and department chairs and other school leaders and asked them about our fellows and said, compared to other new teachers you've seen, how do our fellows look? So this was a complex survey, but the result was the vast majority said, these fellows are exceptional. As brand new teachers, they are exceptional classroom teachers. And these were the principals who had, they weren't getting anything from us, they had no reason to, to lie. Um, possibly more importantly, we also said to them, tell us about these brand new teachers and how you see them as potential leaders. 92% of those principals and school leaders said that these fellows are outstanding at sharing their ideas drawing their peers in, and getting the group to work together. These are brand new teachers. So when I tell you about our goal is to get this, the elements in the system working together differently, we're starting to see some signs of success here. So in terms of numbers, um, this is what we're looking at. I'm gonna try and use the green thing now. So this bottom, I apologize, this font's a little bit small, but this is um, running from this year up until uh, 2022. The dark blue at the bottom is our teaching fellows in the five-year program. So we're in our steady state condition there. We have about 160 teaching fellows at any given time. This lighter blue bar here is our senior fellows. 
and that's this network, when I tell you it's growing every year, this is where it's growing, because these folks are still out there doing amazing things. So every year, we add about 30-ish senior fellows to that network. Um, they are coming back in, working with the program, making us better. We just hired somebody as staff. They are very much the lead in the Knowles Academy that I just told you about. So we're starting to see them folding back in, making the program stronger, but also having a tremendous effect on teachers and educators outside of the Knowles community. And then finally, this green bar up here, this is a projection, but this is what we think we're looking at with uh, the Knowles Academy. The number of teachers that we'll be able to reach each year by offering these courses that are smaller bites of this fellowship program that are tailored to particular schools and districts. And of course, it's nice to talk about fellows and teachers, but if you can't talk about students, then I'm not sure this point. So here's where we are with students. Um, the blue at the bottom is the number of um, students that are taught by our fellows each year. So on average, they teach about 110 students. Not every senior fellow teaches every year, but you can see that we're getting a pretty good a pretty good number. If you can't read that over there, we're at about, um, right now I think just about 35, 40,000 students per year, and that's growing every year. The green is the additional students that we think we're gonna be having an impact on once we get this Knowles Academy built out. Okay, so I wanna come back to the pine trees of Gaviotis and, and wrap this up here. Um, one of the interesting things that has happened is they, the folks in Gaviotis have discovered that after a time, the pine trees were no longer necessary, that they could let those go in certain sections, let them die out, and this understory continued to flourish. So this is important for us, because we are not, with our teachers, we are not trying to build them up as, like I said, the heroes in the school, you know, the Pied Piper, without them everything falls apart. That is not what we're trying to do. We are trying to see change in the system. So we're trying to help these teachers be catalysts such that they can be in schools, for one year, five years, 10 years, and they have left something valuable behind that will continue to flourish. So we are doing some research on that. We're trying to pull together some data. That's a tough one to measure, but that's our goal. And the fact that this is what's happening, um, this works as a nice analogy for us because Gaviotis is continuing to flourish even without those pine trees that were the catalysts early on. So just to wrap up where I've been, um, our goal here is we're trying to change the education system by seeding it with catalysts, with outstanding beginning science and math teachers. We're building a national network. We have over 300 teachers in this network right now. This grows by about 30 to 35 each year who have had the full benefits of our fellowship. In addition, it's growing by numbers that we can't even get figured out how to measure by the effect that they're having in their schools. On top of that, we're adding the Knowles Academy, which is going to be teachers that we have a direct uh, impact on, not quite as intensive as the fellowship, but we, we think it's going to be a good impact regardless. And finally, um, just to come back, the ultimate goal here was we believe that the United States needs more and better math and science teachers. And we have done this, we've been doing it since 2002 through our fellowship program. Um, I think we've done a really good job at that. But this, where we are now, this phase right now, is we have this, this idea of transforming, not by replicating our fellowship all over the country or building a, you know, Knowles West Coast or whatever, but transformation through scaling what our fellows do in their schools. And I will leave you with my favorite quote about teaching. Um, in a completely rational society, the best of us would be teachers, and the rest of us would have to settle for something else. <laughs> And I use this quote as often as I can because I think the most famous quote about teaching is that one about those who can do, those who cannot teach. You've heard this? That's George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw never taught a thing in his life. So don't believe him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Anyway, with that, that is the end of my presentation. I thank you for your time and attention, and I would be delighted to answer any questions you may have.